Welcome to Gavels Down, Voices Up with me, Rachel King. This is where we leave convention at the courtroom door and dive into the real stories, bold opinions, and the change-making ideas that the legal world often keeps quiet. I'm here to shake up the system, share unfiltered insights, and amplify voices that need to be heard. So are you ready? Let's get it. Gavels down and voices up. Welcome back to Gavels Down, Voices Up. My name's Rachel King, and today you are in for a treat. We have a very special episode. We're going to be talking about something that is trending all over TikTok. First, if you're not following me, go and do so at The Lawyer King on TikTok and all of the socials, and then you'll get a bit, a taste of what I mean. But here it is. Today is all about the top five things that you can do to improve your chances of winning in court. That's right. We're talking the five most important, in my experience, tips, no matter what kind of legal case you are in. This could be a family law dispute. It could be a contested conservatorship or will or trust contest. It could be a neighbor dispute, a real estate dispute, a personal injury dispute. It could be all of the things, right? I'm going to say because on social media, I've gotten a lot of hate for saying maybe, maybe, maybe not. Criminal cases, certainly criminal cases are their own entire beast. And so if you're involved in a criminal case, you want to talk to your criminal defense attorney and take all of your advice from them. I don't do criminal law, so I'm not speaking to criminal cases in this video. I'm talking about civil cases. All right, so now that we've gotten that disclaimer out, because I know somebody's coming at me about the uh, Fifth Amendment right not to self-incriminate. That's not what I'm talking about in this. I'm talking about how you can really create a case, the best possible case for yourself. So let's get into them. The first one, understand the laws. Now this maybe goes without saying, except I'm shocked at how many people really don't understand the laws for the case that they are involved in. If it is a child custody case, you want to understand the laws in your area about how the court makes decisions regarding child custody. For example, in California, it's a best interest standard. Yeah, it's nice to know that it's the best interest standard, but you want to know more than that. You want to know what makes up the best interest standard. What is it that the court is going to consider and what's going to be important to the court under the best interest standard? Same for child support. What is it that the court, what are the laws around child support? Are there presumptions in child support? What are the laws around whether a will is valid? What are the laws about whether you have to pay half of the fence that your neighbor put up? What are the laws about when you can create a will, right? Maybe you're not incapacitated, you have dementia, but what are the laws? Understand the laws of the case that you're in. I cannot emphasize that enough. That doesn't mean that you just go to Google. Certainly Google can help, right? I'm a lawyer. I use Google. I love Google, right? We have amazing, amazing technologies that allow searches to really help provide a wealth of information. But you want to go farther than Google. You want to go farther than the person that you're sitting next to at the bar or the person on social media that says, I know exactly what the laws are. Here's what they say. Go talk to an attorney. If you don't like what the attorney said, go get a second opinion. Remember, in this case, you're not specifically looking at the laws that are on your side or for an attorney to tell you what you want to hear. You really want to understand the laws. You have to understand the laws. Why? Because that helps you with everything else that comes. You simply cannot put forth your best case if you don't understand the laws. Second, you need to have evidence for those laws. You see why knowing the laws is important? If you are in a child custody battle and you're looking at best interest standard and you know what a best interest standard is, you will know that the court looks at the history of the using of controlled, illicit, or even legal substances. Think marijuana, alcohol, cocaine, um, even legal prescriptions or prescribed drugs, right? The court is going to consider any history that exists with regards to uh, regard to substances. All right. 
So if that's a concern, if you have a concern that other parent uses marijuana, even if it's legal, but uses it in front of the children or gets so stoned out of their mind, they can't function and parent, you're going to want to bring in that evidence. And you know what's not the best evidence? You saying, hey, other parent over here is always high doing gummies, bongs, joints, blunts, whatever. I'm not really into pot, so I'm just naming the few that I know off the top of my head, right? You don't want to just say it because guess what? Other parents going to take the stand and be like, not true. No, I don't. I do not. Absolutely not. Never been arrested. Don't have a history. Not using drugs. And now we have a he said, she said. So that doesn't really work very well, right? The courts hear every single case that a judge hears is a he said, she said. They've got the plaintiff saying one thing and they've got the defendant saying the other. So while your testimony is a source of evidence, you really want to go beyond that. Have a recent DUI, have pictures on social media that the person has posted of them using drugs. If it's a, a case where money is involved, show maybe a whole bunch of spending or show the transfers into their bank accounts using bank statements, right? So you want to have the actual evidence that will corroborate your testimony. You're going to say it and then you're going to say, and here, so, you know, Sally Smith took, and I'm making up Sally Smith, all right? I don't even think I know a Sally Smith. Sally Smith stole a million dollars out of the bank account. Sally's going to get on the stand and be like, I did not steal a million dollars. So what are you going to do? You're going to bring more evidence that says, well, here's an account that had a million dollars in it. Here's the proof that it got transferred to another account. Oh, the account that it got transferred to is owned by Sally Smith. And now here's Sally Smith going out and here's the proof that she bought a brand new car that's registered to her name. Here's the proof that she bought a brand new, I was going to say jet, but you're not buying a jet for a million bucks. So here's all of the proof. And guess what? She didn't buy them from, from me, the person she stole the money from. They're all in her name. So the bank statements that show the transfer, the documentation that shows the purchases, the ownership for the, the assets that were purchased, if there are any, you see, you understand, you want the evidence that goes in to support your law. Additionally, 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 you want evidence that will uh, undermine the other person, right? So if Sally says, I did not steal a million dollars from you. I took it because you told me I could take it and buy a house. And so I went and bought a house. And you're like, well, that's cool. Let me show the deed that says the house is in your name, Sally Smith, and me asking to be put on title via email and you saying, no, it's my house. It's not yours. You have no right to it. That's pretty good evidence to undermine Sally Smith's position that she bought it for you. You understand? You want corroborating evidence, not just your testimony. If all else fails, testimony is a good idea. You want to have pretty solid testimony, but you want to have the additional evidence. You want to take the next step, right? That's where an attorney can come in and help you. All right, third, be aware of the courtroom demeanor or your courtroom demeanor, I should say. And I get a lot of pushback on this saying, uh, I shouldn't be judged by my courtroom demeanor. I should be judged on the facts. Well, guess what? We are a society of judgmental people and judges are people too. And they are going to judge you. They're going to be watching you and seeing how you handle yourself, how you react, because a lot of your demeanor will help a judge decide if you are credible or not credible, if you're telling the truth or if you're not telling the truth, if you think the other person is lying or not, right? They really do uh, use body language and overall demeanor to help them decide a case. I actually had one judge say once, it was, this was fascinating to me. He said at the end of a whole trial, he said, I've been, I've made my decision. He ruled in our favor. So that was delightful. Um, but he said, I've watched the party's demeanor through this entire trial. And now for a quick break. This episode of Gabbles Down Voices Up is proudly brought to you by King Law Firm, Attorneys at Law Incorporated. We're not just about winning cases. We're about making a difference. Whether it's family law, probate litigation, or standing up against elder abuse, we bring experience, empathy, and excellence to the courtroom. At King Law Firm, we're more than lawyers. We're your team in your corner, advocating for your rights and making your voice heard. Visit us at thelawyerking.com and on the socials at The Lawyer King to see how we can fight for you and with you. King Law Firm, Attorneys at Law Incorporated, where your fight becomes our fight. 
Now let's get back to today's episode. And after watching every single thing that they've done and how they've spoken and how they've reacted and their overall positioning in this case, along with the evidence, because of course the judge considered the evidence, I believe Miss King's client over the other one. So they ruled in our favor. So it was partly my client's behavior and mannerisms and ability to hold my client in a, a, a... I guess the most positive way, right? So what to look for. You want to keep your mouth shut if it is not your opportunity to talk. No interrupting. You want to dress appropriately. I get it. It might be hot outside. That doesn't mean you show up in spaghetti straps and booty shorts to court. That doesn't mean you show up in flip-flops and gym shorts with a tank top. Like, get it together. Make it look like you put yourself together and you cared. Some judges actually even have dress codes for their courtroom. So you want to look at that. You want to respect the judge. I say go in and treat this courtroom experience, treat the judge with the utmost respect because ultimately it's this judge that's making some pretty significant decisions. So the least you can do is like put on a good face, right? Brush your hair for crying out loud. Keep your cell phones off. Don't record. All of those things. Those are actually rules in court, but you want to comply with them. Be super nice to the deputies. Be super respectful to the clerks, not just the judge. Why? Because when the doors close and you're kicked out of that courtroom, guess what? That deputy, the clerk, all of the people, they're going to go talk to the judge. It may be casual, but the judge is going to consider it. And last, the thing that most people hate the most, watch your size and your facial expressions. None of the... Ah, or the rolling of the eyes, or the huge facial uh, hand gestures, or shaking the head no, you know, vigorously when the person is lying, or mouthing the word no, none of that. Keep all of it to yourself. Keep a pad of paper and draw and look down if you need to, but keep it to yourself. It's not your opportunity to talk. The judge is watching you, the judge is considering you, and you will have an opportunity to say your side of the story. So if the person is lying on the stand, take a note that you need to readdress it either with your attorney or with the judge as necessary. Don't do the size, don't do all of that. It's very distracting, it's super annoying, and guess what? Judges hate it. Keep your courtroom demeanor together. If you cry, that's okay. Lawsuits can be stressful. Keep a little box of tissues. If you need a break, ask for a break. All right, lastly, one of the things I think that's forgotten more than anything is you need to ask for something specific. Whether you are the plaintiff or the defendant, in any kind of case, you need to be specific with what you're asking of the judge. If you were hurt at a slip and fall, You need to say, I want $10,000 for my medical expenses, $15,000 for my loss of income, and $10,000 for pain and suffering, or whatever the case may be. Ask for specifics. If you simply, in that case, just say, I want pain and suffering, I want my medical bills reimbursed, and I want my loss of income, the judge is going to be like, yeah, I don't know what you want. Like, I don't know how much that is, right? Same thing when it comes to custody and visitation. I think that a p- other parent has a really bad alcohol issue, and they work really late at night and have to wake up really early for work uh, four days a week. So I just don't think that they should have our child um, overnights on school nights. Okay, so you told everything to the judge other than what you wanted. Therefore, I think we should, I would like the court to order that opposing parent does not use alcohol during any time that he has the children or she, I'm sorry, I'm using he just because it's my default since I'm a female, uh, anytime he has visitation and 12 hours prior. And I think that visitation should be limited to the weekends when 
uh, other parent is off work so that the other parent can really enjoy the time with the children. They don't have to wake up extra early or stay at daycare extra late. I can do that since I am home during those times. All right, you wanna provide the solution. Ask for the specifics. If you're a defendant, I want the court to determine that I did not harm the plaintiff. I did fulfill my terms of the contract. I want the court to deny plaintiff's claims, and I want the court to order $15,000 in my attorney's fees because I had to defend this lawsuit. Ask for specifics. Judges don't come up with them on their own. I have heard so many times judges say, yeah, but I don't know what you want. And the people will say, I just don't want this, or I, this person is doing this, or I, my feelings were hurt. My neighbor's tree keeps staining my concrete because they're cherry tree. That isn't telling the court what you want them to do. Therefore, I would like the court to order that the tree is trimmed or if the tree cannot be trimmed on my side, I would like the tree to be removed. And if plaintiff is or defendant is going to replace it with something, I'd like it to be something that is on their side of the fence and does not encroach onto mine. Get it? You need to give the specifics. All right, that's it on this fabulous TikTok episode of what is trending, how to improve your chances of winning in court. I hope these help you. And I hope that no matter what court proceeding you're in, you can implement some of them. If you have any examples of somebody that you know that did or did not do these things and, and you think it affected the outcome of their case, or you're currently dealing with somebody that is doing all of these things that are so frustrating, or maybe you did them and you won. Score for you. I would love to hear it. My name's Rachel King. And until next time, we're going to put our gavels down and our voices up. Thanks for tuning in to Gavels Down, Voices Up. Like what you heard? Then don't just sit there. Subscribe, share, and tell me your thoughts. I'm Rachel King, bringing not just my opinions to the mic, but about the courtroom too. Your part, keep listening, keep engaging. And until next time, let's keep those gavels down and our voices up unmistakably up.